1986 passes. Well, we, yeah, we, we basically made the video, we shot it in May of 1986. We, John edited it, he's credited as director, you know, for good reason, because he, he's the one who took all that footage um, in our, and, and edited it. And, and really, it's a great piece of editing. And he, so he's the one who's really the architect, in my opinion, but I produced it with him. And it's, our, we, it's a joint effort. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we definitely share in the ownership of heavy metal parking lot but um it was we started screening it in the fall of 1986 and and then showed it around the washington area maryland where we're from um but we would just at the time you didn't have any opportunities to screen video and very few opportunities to project video uh it was and film festivals did not take video um so you were really limited in what you could do and we ended up um, just giving it out on video, VHS tape, to anybody who wanted a copy. I didn't show it on public access because I didn't want my my work to know that this is what I was, you know, recording. I mean, I was proud of it, but I think because we wanted to be documentary filmmakers as opposed to public access users, that was our goal. We were happy to just try to see if we could get some documentary uh, um, cred with it and also I didn't need to let management know that I was making this kind of uh, content so that was fine um, and because it was pretty raw as you know and uh, we showed it I think at some art galleries and some nightclubs and some record stores and we did get it at the Kennedy Center the American Film Institute Theater was there and they had video projections, so we got it screened a few times there. But by 1990, several years later, we pretty much had shelved it. We, we just put it in mothballs. We were tired of making our friends watch it, and we just couldn't see where, we just, it was fine. We felt it had run its course um, because we, we just didn't, we couldn't license it. We didn't have any way to afford the music rights. And be, as you know, we borrowed <laughs> the music. That got sorted out later, much later, and it's now on DVD and uh, was also on, on TV um, as part of a, a show called Parking Lot, which went on the Trio TV network. And uh, so we've had some success with the, this Parking Lot franchise, uh, but uh, it didn't happen until like 1994, 95, we didn't know it was getting any interest outside of just our friends. and. Um, the Washington D.C. area, but people had been taping it and trading it. In fact, it got into Los Angeles at a store called Mondo Video, a go go, which was down on Vermont Avenue. It moved around Melrose, Vermont. It moved around a good deal. A guy named Colonel Rob uh, ran the store with his brother, and and he had this um, you know really cool, hip, cult video store. And they loved it. They got a copy, and, and Colonel Rob and his friends were just great at promoting it for us, unbeknownst to us. They were actually taking, you know, make anybody who came in, they were showing it to them. Because, you know, it's, and so they, they were renting a copy, and at some point, uh, Sofia Coppola uh, had rented it and showed it, rather wanted to use it on um, a, video, a, a TV show she was putting together called. Um, high octane TV. She called John High and she got his name out of the phone book and then called him up out of the blue. This was around 1994 and said, Look, I, I like the video. I'd like to show it in my TV show. And John's like, What? Who, who, who is this? What? What's going on? He didn't know. It was so I, literally out of the blue. And this is, of course, you know, way before the internet or finding anybody. She got John's name and phone number from long distance information. So, that was our first inkling that it was being um, getting known, getting recognition, especially out in the entertainment uh, business in the entertainment community in Hollywood. And we called up Mondo Video and talked to Colonel Rob, and he was great. And you know, he was really happy to hear from us. And we were, you know, became fast friends and found out who had been renting it and who was interested in it and liked it, and then. Sofia Coppola, she, the, the TV show didn't happen, unfortunately, um, but they were gonna put it in there if it did uh, get off the ground. But um, after that is when we decided, 
hmm, maybe we should get it out and start showing it again. And then create a uh, bit of a, uh, you know, we, we see what we could else, what else we could do to further this brand. And that's when we came up with the sequel, Neil Diamond parking lot. And then later, a few years later, Harry Potter parking lot, and, and, we, and ultimately the TV series that we were involved with, which went on Trio. We've had a, a lot of um, uh, good fortune, but it was all unplanned and a total surprise. So did you ever find out who it was that sort of took this missing link and, and put well, it Well, yeah, we, have a, we, we definitely know uh, a friend of ours, uh, somebody named Mike Heath who lives in San Francisco is a friend, and he showed up at my job. I used to work for Discovery Channel um, in the early days, like from 1990 to 95. After the public access studio I worked at closed, I was on staff at Discovery in the early days, you know, back before it became this, you know, global powerhouse, which it is now. I mean, it was becoming that, but I got to watch this incredible, you know, rise of this, this um, cable, you know, network. Um, I, Mike showed up at my job one day and asked for copies of uh, Heavy Metal Parking Lot because he was moving to California and uh, he wanted to take some video copies to uh, give to friends. And Mike is, we consider him Johnny Appleseed of uh, Heavy Metal Parking Lot because he took about, I think just four VHS tapes, which I gave him. And from there it got to, um, I think, uh, there was a musician who sadly passed away, a fellow named Bill Bartell, who was, uh, went by the name Pat, Pat Fear in a band called White Flag. I mean, I know a lot of this just because I, I know all this esoteric history about it because we've tr kind of tracked it and, and can connect the dots. And Bill um, got a copy from Mike because they were friends and Bill gave, so people were copying it and giving it to their friends, a multi-generation, I mean, pre-viral video. You know, you were copying tape to tape. And so this, in this case, the tape, you know, Bill had it. Mike gave it to Bill. Bill gave it to a fellow named Mike who was a roadie for Nirvana. Uh, and then he took it on the road um, with Nirvana. And then everybody who came on the Nirvana bus. This is all, nobody, I learned this later. You know, I'm not privy to this history at the time. This is what I've been told. So. It's like you know the elders passing down this history. Um, I, I've I've just kind of heard this, and you know I've kind of been verified. But because I know people would go on the bus, and so I mean I I'm so grateful that this happened. But it was so unplanned and so such a surprise that it was getting into people's you know orbit that I could never have dreamed of, and uh, and that they liked it. And that when we finally started to go public more with it and dust it off and, and then try to work on some more um, similar uh, documentaries that we were able to at least have a springboard, you know, and, and, and people like Colonel Rob at Mondo, uh, you know, he, was still, he would then show other stuff we had and became just a, you know, further was a patron of what we were doing and helping to distribute it, you know, again, pre-internet. <laughs> you still had to rent it or, or tape it, you know, right. go VHS to VHS. No dial-up yet. No, no dial-up, no video, no, no. No AOL. No yeah. AOL, <laughs> no way, way, way. God, video, was, I mean, the internet, I, I guess email was happening at the time, maybe mid-90s, but in a primitive fashion, so. Sure.